I be picking up my Italian. Power of whom? It's not about what you show. It's about what you conceal. But it does not shout, no. It whispers. This sign says it's bluffing. This one says, state-of-the-art diesel technology. Hey, Bobby, what's the French for diesel? <laughs> the pizzeria back home is a disaster. So I come to Italy to get in touch with my roots. This country sparks my creativity. When I go back home, I sell pizzas like an Argentinian stallion. Unlikely, really, because at the renowned Michelin-starred Labatega restaurant right here in Tuscany, they've been creating a new range of stone-baked ciabatta pizzas exclusively for Goodfellas. The new Labatega range looks like closing time for pizzerias. Don't put me on hold. Buying car insurance over the phone. It's all talk with those call centers. Click onto swiftcover.com. We cut out call centers, so 70% of our customers could save. And you could get a quote in less than a minute. What are you up to? Just stuffing a chicken. That's a coincidence. Swiftcover.com. Swift savings. Click, click, don't cluck, cluck. Hi, Mum. Oh, hello, love. You busy? No, no. How's the arm? On the mend. Mum. Is there anyone around to look after you? Oh, yes. Yes, Janet said she'd pop in. Janet Morgan? Your mother needs you, but you can't be in two places at once. WPA can help organize and fund the short-term care your parent needs when they come home from hospital. For details of parent care, visit wpa.org.uk. At 17, I went to prison for murder. By 19, I was penniless and heartbroken. I almost drowned at 20. Then I had my memory erased at 28. And by 29, I was in Neverland. My real life doesn't need any extra drama. That's why my card is American Express. Barbecue's a doddle compared to cleaning the blooming thing. But now it's just another easy job for Fairy Power Spray. Simply squirt, wait, and wipe. Easy peasy. Fairy Power Spray. Burnt on food, beware. So here's the deal a new Renault Clio Rush from just 6895 on the road. This season, Bear is the new black, a bear's tail. A new sitcom for a man or a woman. A bear's tail, Friday at 10.35 on 4. I be picking up my Italian. Life-changing decision for Sandy in tonight's season finale of the OC. Check it out over on E4. It's a nine thing, meaning it's some um, at nine. Next here on Channel 4, the girls are job hunting in Chester. Who wouldn't hire them? Holly Oaks is next. Hot. 
Yes, the milk bug picks up the full works. Sandra, we need to talk. Sure. Well, it's about this. What? Oh, them. Don't worry. They're not really here. They're just a metaphor. You know, a visual representation of the bubbly fruit refreshment of Tango Clear. Hi, Sandra. Oh, nice metaphor. Thanks. It's clear when you've been tangoed. But three new rides this year. So what are you waiting for? Legoland Windsor. Sit back and enjoy the rides. <laughs> Legoland Land. More choice. More taste. More freshness. Subway sandwiches made just the way you like it on freshly baked bread with your favorite tasty vegetables and mouth-watering sauces. More hot fillings, like sweet onion chicken teriyaki or Italian meatball. You expect more, and you get more. Subway. Eat fresh. Hey, it's me again, Mr. Mouse. You know, people think car insurance is boring, 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 until... Suddenly, what do you know? It becomes really interesting. But if you're with Eshaw.com and let them fix it, Kelly can give you a free courtesy car to see you through. Not only could you save yourself a bunch of money with Eshaw.com, you'd save yourself a load of trouble, too. <laughs> That's not boring. I'll tell you what is boring, though. Cats. Eshaw.com. Car insurance at nice prices. Come on, give us a click. I like to let my imagination run riot. <laughs> I like things that are built to last. I like to know I can plan for the future. I like standard life. You're as cold as ice. Willing to sacrifice. You're as cold as ice. Willing to sacrifice. Introducing Head & Shoulders Cool Menthol for maximum refreshment. It gets rid of 100% of flakes with an icy cooling sensation. It's the coolest way to get rid of dandruff. You're as cold as Don't let dandruff get in the way of something beautiful. Are you supposed to be in a lesson? There's no point in learning if we are not to learn. Schools are fooling their children. Their teachers are not coping. Dispatches investigates the truth about Britain's schools. Undercover teacher, Thursday at 9 on 4. All the very latest from the Channel 4 News at 7 o'clock. First, some tea and sympathy for Sam in Hollyoaks on 4. What time are you going out? I'm not. Yes, you are. Get a little closer with Wrigley's Extra Ice, sponsors of Hollyoaks. Sponsored by Extra Rice.
cheesecake or strawberry? Yes. <laughs> Muller Light tastes delicious, and because it's virtually fat-free, you can say yes whenever you feel like it. Leader Muller Life. We were quite happy with British Gas, but um, decidedly, basically for, for monetary reasons, uh, we had a salesman knock on the door from uh, another company. In my opinion, the bills weren't a lot um, cheaper than uh, British Gas's. We didn't find the service as good as British Gas. We felt treated like a, a number, so we decided to go back. Every 60 seconds, someone switches back to British Gas. British Gas, doing the right thing. New L'Oreal Perfect Slim Patch, the first anti-cellulite patch to target the appearance of stubborn cellulite. 79% confirmed effectiveness. New from L'Oreal Perfect Slim. Four zoo animals are visiting new places. Nature! It's all over me! Making new friends. Hi there! Oh, gee! And having the wildest adventure on Earth. Where are you giants from? We're from New York. All hail the New York Giants! Madagascar. And out. You are light. I don't lift weights. I lose weight. Free yourself from baggage. Okay, cut. The camera loves you, baby. Set yourself free with 0800 Reverse. No cash, no cards, no mobile, no baggage. Yeah, good. I could kill for a steak. 0800 Reverse. The way to call Reverse Charge. Hello, Dixons. Let's have a look. JVC Digital Camcorder with a built-in digital camera and a £150 saving. iRiver 20 gigabyte MP3 player with photo viewer and radio. Save a total of £50. When would you like it? That's not a problem. Install now at Dixons. The future for less. War of the Worlds. Venus Divine, the only razor with comfort-coated blades, surrounded by intensive moisture strips enriched with botanical oils, that gives you a divinely close shave for divinely smooth skin. Venus Divine from Gillette. For a tropical way to divinely smooth skin, try Venus Divine Paradise. Questions on dandruff with L'Oreal Skin Care Advisor. My problem is that it keeps coming back. You need to attack its cause by treating the scalp. New Elvive Anti-Dandruff from L'Oreal Paris. What makes Elvive so different from the others? Elvive is the only anti-dandruff shampoo with Equiderm. Elvive treats the scalp so flakes won't come back. The result? Great looking flake-free hair. Elvive Anti-Dandruff, proven effectiveness under dermatological control and great looking hair too. Visit L'OrealParis.com for your free sample. This week, only in OK, Jordan and Peter's new arrival. Meet our gorgeous new baby junior. Only in OK. Last. Sponsored by Extra Rice. Now for an exclusive insight into what's really going on with the characters, sign up to their daily text service by texting Hollyoaks to 83188. Stay here, the Channel 4 News is moments away. very alleyways where Anne Boleyn met Dick Whittington. Too far-fetched. Yeah, sounds good, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. <laughs> I'm in love. Oh, are you? <laughs> Cozy, isn't it? Got any extra? Get a little closer with Wrigley's Extra, sponsors of Hollyoaks. I'm Frank Bruno. Keep watching. Big Brothers. Big Mouth. Big Mouth! Are the Big Brother Bunch twisting your melons? Big Brother's our show, not their show. Whoa! What's that? What's that? What's that? Oh, crap. Well, open your big mouth and get in touch. I would have kept myself quiet. I can't oh, imagine that, so now. Big Brother's Big Mouth, this week at 7.30 on E4. E4 is available on cable, satellite and now free view.
New Giotto and coffee are perfect together. Light wafer bites with a smooth center covered in roasted hazelnuts, incredibly Moorish. Giotto and coffee, you just can't keep them apart. I wish I always worried a little less and eaten a little more. When I was younger, I wish I'd drunk more beer. <laughs> <laughs> and I wish I'd got more grass stains. Girls, you are never too old. Grass stains, you hussy. <laughs> <laughs> Give him to Lord Pack. Across the country, the ground is revealing its secrets as the big Roman dig continues. This is absolutely brilliant. What do you think? Now, if I'm here in the Roman period, I'd now be up to my ankles in water. Oh, there we gosh. are. It does. What a jam. Join Time Team's Big Roman Dig live tonight from 8 on 4. And we're joining Tony for that in just one hour. First, on the eve of the G8, our final news from Africa is presented by Jon Snow in Uganda and Chris and Guru Murthy here in London. The British bid on tenterhooks tonight up against the old rivals in France for the prize of hosting the Olympics in 2012. Good evening. With the final vote just hours away, Britain has thrown everything at its Olympic bid, from Blair and Beckham to the royal family too. Tonight, amid a process about as transparent as the election of a new pope, is London's 2012 pitch suddenly looking like it could defeat the favourite Paris after all? Also tonight, gunships at Glen Eagles, as police and protesters, peaceful and anarchic, verge on Scotland ahead of the G8 summit. How much is still to play for? With Britain already accused of exaggerating the prospective deal on African debt, South Africa's finance minister warns G8 leaders, don't fumble it and lose your nerve. And from Uganda tonight, from Kampala's Arua Park Transport Terminus, Channel 4 News from Africa, ahead of tomorrow's G8 summit in Glen Eagles. Tonight, out of darkness into light, two countries in transit. Can the G8 catch their tide? From Uganda, resurrecting Idi Amin, one African country's journey from tyranny to economic progress. And from Liberia, is the Earth World Footballer of the Year, George Weir, the man to lead Africa's most dispossessed country back to prosperity? I, I answer a call for my people, and I think this is one of the greatest things to die for my people. You know, I'm a national hero. Well, the leaders haven't arrived yet, but there's unprecedented security at the site of the G8 summit at Glen Eagles, with military helicopters flying overhead. As police warn any protesters who use violence, they'll take robust action to stop them. After yesterday's clashes in Edinburgh, the Live 8 organiser, Bob Geldof, dismissed those involved as a bunch of losers. In Oxerada now, our Scotland correspondent, Sarah Smith. Sarah. Christian, as you can probably see behind me, the very first of the protesters have arrived in Octorada tonight. Two rather polite cyclists who are having their belongings extensively searched by the police at the moment. And there are plenty of officers here, 4,000 in total. That's as many police as there are nervous residents in Octorada. And tomorrow, both of them expect to be outnumbered by the demonstrators. You know it must be serious when the US Army arrive their helicopters buzzing over a small Scottish town that just doesn't know what to expect tomorrow. Ochterader's first bomb scare this morning reminded police anarchists aren't the only security threat. But that is why thousands of officers have been drafted in to try to contain any violent protests tomorrow. I think uh, it, it's not our job to stop people making headlines in themselves and, and as I say, I, I hope those who want to protest lawfully will get the opportunity to make their headlines. Uh, but clearly, uh, anybody who's trying to make headlines of the type that we saw yesterday in Edinburgh can expect a very similar professional police response to that. One demonstration will be allowed to gather in this park about lunchtime tomorrow, but only 5,000 people, otherwise the police warn they will stop anybody else from joining in. 
before marchers are then allowed to walk up this road towards Glen Eagles Hotel. But this is as close as demonstrators will be allowed to get. And at this point, they could try and break through the fence and make it to the hotel about 500 metres away. But tomorrow's march is expected to be largely peaceful. Other activists who are determined to try and stop the summit taking place at all have entirely separate secret actions planned for elsewhere. Protesters plan to hike over the hills towards Glen Eagles tonight. From their campsite 20 miles away, some will attend the organised march. Others want to stop the summit taking place. In the morning, we'll be preparing for actions to try and prevent the G8 leaders from um, meeting. Do you think you can prevent them from making it to Glen Eagles Hotel? Um, that would be the ideal outcome. Um, failing that, we'd like to disrupt the summit as much as possible. The five-mile perimeter fence is bound to be breached tomorrow, but police insist anyone breaking in won't get far. And there are already restrictions on the road, so the police fear may be blocked by protesters tomorrow. Anyone arrested during the violence in Edinburgh yesterday won't be coming to Ochterader. Protesters appearing in court today aren't allowed anywhere near Glen Eagles as part of their bail conditions. Police here say they will remain approachable and good-humoured, but they are keeping their riot gear nearby while the army are watching from the sky. The police had hoped that by last week allowing a march to get this close to the hotel tomorrow, that would take some of the heat out of the demonstrations. And it will satisfy some protesters who just want to make their voices heard as close to the world leaders as they can. But visiting that protesters campsite today, it was obvious there are hundreds, if not thousands, of protesters who are determined. They want to try and disrupt the summit as much as possible, and they won't be put off doing so just because there's a march being allowed through the town tomorrow. Sarah Smith in Octorada. Well now, Jon Snow is in Uganda for an alternative view of the G8 process. Here in Africa tonight, looking north, no one could pretend that populations are hanging on every word in the build-up to the G8. Uganda is no exception, but it is a country that neatly encompasses so much of what the world leaders need to chime with. An unresolved war, AIDS, malaria, but above all, as I've been finding out, the need to produce finished goods that will sell on the global market. Uganda has taken the first step by coming to terms with its past. No, not war on a suburban street in Kampala, but the shooting of a major British film, The Last King of Scotland. It's about Idi Amin. The very fact that 50 UK technicians and crew can come here for three months to make it speaks to the tranquility and security that is modern-day Kampala. That a film can be made about Amin speaks to how far this country has come in the 25 years since his bloody tyranny. One actor feels it more keenly than most. Amin killed his father. <coughs> I was very young at the time when they killed him, and it affected my life, my schooling, mm. my family. So. so then how does it feel to see, in a sense, an entertainment being made about him? Um, it just makes me appreciate that nature takes, has, has a toll on everybody, even the most powerful fall. The spectre of the past, whether recorded on film or not, is there eternally as the benchmark by which the present in Uganda is judged. For the first time, I think that Uganda is getting to be known for other things other than disaster, other than bad politics. We've had more wars than just a mean, and people have moved on. The Ugandans have moved on and they're doing other things generally. In 1979, whilst reporting Amin's end, I found confidential government files blowing in the street strangely ordered cabinet minutes, and then a secret file that listed the hundreds of state research officers, the informers, torturers, who staffed Uganda's darkest hours. Today, they're gone. Amin's home, the command post, has even moved on, even if only to become the North Korean embassy. At Nile Mansions, the hotel, once seen of Amin's worst excess, is today being rehabilitated. Transitional democracy is moving on too. A multi-party system is to be put to a referendum. In moving on, Kampala itself has boomed from a million to three million in the years since Amin. 
Skills have developed too. Light industry is everywhere, on every roadside. Briefly in the recovery, economic growth surged to double figures, but now it's plateaued at 3.5%. And there's the rub. The country grew on its raw materials. To go beyond, it must market finished products. The power of the Karuma Falls north of here is just one symbol of the pent-up strength of this place. Genuine opportunity for the industrialized world to intersect with. And not merely to attract tourism, where there is little, to observe the verdant landscape or the abundant wildlife. This is a crossroads, for whether by chance or design, in their timing, Blair, Geldof and the others have proved right. Unless there is change, unless the industrialized nations can seize it, and Africa is enabled to join and prosper in the globalized world, an opportunity will have been lost, and the consequence for the world in and beyond Africa hardly bears imagining. And we'll have more from John later, and on the footballer George Weir's bid to run war-torn Liberia. Now, with just hours to go before the decision on the 2012 Olympic Games, Singapore is rife with politics, intrigue and rumour. Sport, the last thing on anyone's minds. Heading the frantic last-minute lobbying for London's bid, David Beckham. He said he was desperate for the Games to be held in what he called his manner. Tony Blair was apparently avoiding his biggest rival. The French president, Jacques Chirac, had a party for VIP guests. But apart from the final presentations tomorrow morning, it's all up to the International Olympic Committee now, who will reveal the results at lunchtime tomorrow. From Singapore, our Asia correspondent, Ian Williams. Spanish revellers had to watch their step this evening as the Singapore Prime Minister swept past. All eyes are on Singapore as the country hosts a historic event. On his way here, to the city's new arts centre. It's nicknamed the Durian after a spiky tropical fruit. And the president of the International Olympic Committee. And it was the venue of the opening ceremony, attended by celebrities and dignitaries on a scale not seen here before, proving a hazard to those pedestrians and a mouthful for the host. Your Majesty, Your Royal Highness, Excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. I welcome all participants and guests. With just 16 hours to go before the vote, the President of the International Olympic Committee said it was just too close to call. The election of the host city for the 2012 Games will not be easy in view of the very high quality of the candidates. He was presented with a new breed of orchid, though a nettle might better have represented this contest, perhaps the fiercest ever. A thousand people attended this grand opening, though only one-tenth of them will matter tomorrow. The IOC members, many of them former athletes, though also including a pharmacist from Toga, a Swiss dentist, a Thai brewery manager, and the former head of the Liechtenstein Girl Scouts. Now present the Orchid birth certificate to President of the IOC, Jacques Rav. One estimate is that 30 IOC members are still undecided. I think it's fair to say that New York itself is like a great Olympic village. But at their final press conference today, athletes lobbying for London said it was impossible to tell how successful their efforts have been. You tend to hear the same stories going round and round again. Um, it's absolutely impossible to accurately predict what's going to happen tomorrow. That makes it very exciting, uh, nerve-wracking as well. To have the Olympics, as I said, in, the, in our manner, would be a special thing to, for you know, kids to have inspiration from different athletes from all around the world. The French, the favourites, are looking for a further boost from the arrival in Singapore of Jacques Chirac, though the president faced questions not on le bid, but on le roast beef. He'd reportedly told leaders of Germany and Russia that only Finnish food is worse than British and that Britain's sole contribution to European agriculture is mad cow disease. Tony Blair, who didn't meet Jacques Chirac today, is now on his way back to Britain for the G8. He'll no doubt be encouraged by the fact the favourite city has failed to win in three out of the last four contests for the Summer Games.
Ian Williams, Channel 4 News, Singapore. Well, in Westminster now is the Labour MP Graham Stringer, a leading figure in Manchester's failed attempts to host the 96 and 2000 Olympics, and the Daily Telegraph sports writer Mihir Bose is in Singapore. Um, Graham Stringer, it should be said, you've never been a big believer in the London bid, but do you think the votes could stack up in favour tomorrow? Well, it, it's very difficult to, for me to say at a distance of 8,000 miles or not. I, I've always thought uh, from quite a distance uh, that it was up to Paris to lose it and I've not seen uh, anything that Paris has done in spite of what uh, Chirac has said uh, that they, they have lost it. But it, it's very difficult. The, the piece you've just done said 30 people probably haven't made up their mind and I can believe that and I can also believe some people who are committed to Madrid uh, or Moscow or any of the cities haven't decided yet where to put their second or third Let votes. Both. How, how much does the actual quality of the bid have to do with this and how much is it down to other factors? Well, a lot of it will at this point in time be down to other factors. You see, what is interesting about this race, as opposed to some of the other races, is that there isn't any city which is considered a really weak city, even Moscow held the games in 1980 and could stage the game. So, as you call it, other factors, which means other sports politic factors. Um, there's, uh, uh, remember elections uh, for the, um, the IOC's executive board and the vice president taking place a few days later. So a vice presidential candidate who thinks if he votes for a city might get their votes uh, for him will also play a part. Graham Stringer, is it fair to think of this as a corruptible process? Certainly when we were part of it, there was real evidence that, uh, that came out following it that there was corruption. Some of those IOC members who took bribes have gone. Uh, I don't believe that every uh, corrupt member of the IOC has been removed. So I think it's a, a better process, but it's not transparent, uh, and it is uh, still uh, corruptible. Mihir Bose, isn't part of the problem that, um, you know, Britain can't even rely on the rest of Europe's support uh, if Madrid and France are knocked out and Britain ends up being up against the Russians? Well, Russia is part of France, uh, part of Europe. Uh, I think the problem is that there are four European countries taking part in this vote. Um, and the French, Paris is bidding for the third time, so that counts, if you like, in the way the IOC wor works um, in its favor. The IOC likes to be endlessly quoted and wooed, and, you know, it feels, well, Paris has come for the third time, therefore it has a certain uh, cachet and a certain number of votes should go in its favor. Um, you can't really have one European candidate because the IOC is a very curious club. You know, there are only about 60 nations represented um, on the IOC. It's not a one country, one vote or something like so that. And, and therefore the composition of the IOC means that um, it's always going to be a very difficult election. So take us through, Mihir, what you think is going to happen, because it's quite a complicated process of people effectively being knocked out. Yes, what is going to happen is that uh, tomorrow morning, after the, uh, tomorrow afternoon, after the presentations, 99 IOC members will vote in the first round because the five cities um, whose representatives that are members of the IOC cannot vote. And then, uh, if a city, of course, gets to 51, that, will, that city will win. That is unlikely. After that, whichever city has the lowest number of votes, shall, shall we say for the sake of argument, Moscow, which looks the weakest, will drop out. And then the three Russian representatives will come in. There will be another vote. So as each, um, each city drops out, the number of voters increase till you so finally get which, to Which order do you think they'll go out in then? Uh, this is a prediction and, yeah. you know, it must come with a health warning. Um, I think Moscow will go first, then New York and then Madrid. So we'll have a final of London and Paris. And it very much depends on how the Madrid votes split. If they split in favour of London, then London could just win by perhaps two or three votes. If they more likely split in favour of Paris, then Paris could probably win by about ten votes. Graham, Graham Stringer, in the last moments, do you wish them well? They're British representatives in a, in a foreign country. Uh, on a human level, I, I wish them well, but I've never supported the bid. Uh, Graham Stringer and Mihir Bose, thank you both for joining us. Well, we've got a specially extended edition of the News at Noon tomorrow to bring you the result of that decision. Sometime around 12.46 approximately, we believe.
Now, cancel debt, reform international trade and increase the aid budget. That's the message to the G8 from African leaders meeting in both Libya and London today. Heads of state from the African Union praised Tony Blair for his campaign to lift the continent out of poverty. They also called for the total cancellation of all African debt and, more importantly, the end to barriers to fair trade. The African finance ministers and business leaders meeting in London today on the eve of the G8 summit had a very similar message. Here's our business correspondent, Faisal Islam. Well, one important summit of world leaders actually finished today in generally cordial fashion, but it was in Libya. Central call to that other summit of powerful leaders tomorrow from the heads of state of the African Union give Africa its deserved influence in world affairs with two places on the UN Security Council and crucially throw open your trade barriers. Meanwhile some of those leaders and their finance ministers jetted straight to London to mingle with some of Africa's new generation of free trade marketeers and the continent's old school corporate aristocracy of the likes of Shell, De Beers and Anglo-American. And the head of the African Union's finance arm, NEPAD, said Africa's on the up and so now's the time for the rich world to act. There's a great improvement. Inflation has come down and uh, uh, fiscal deficits have come below 1%. So if there's a better time to really support Africa so that we can sustain these gains, it is now. It will be a, 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 a wind of opportunity that will have been lost if the, the G8 fails to grab this opportunity and give Africa support. The central message from this conference is that yes, in the long term, it's trade, not poverty history. But tonight, real concern from African finance ministers about the long-term effect of the egotistical squabbling amongst the G8 leadership. This stems from concerns that Italy, and specifically Germany, are not fully signed up to Blair and Brown's aid plan. Africa's leading finance minister, Trevor Manuel, was going out of his way to persuade German TV that African countries now have the mechanisms to ensure that aid and debt relief are not wasted, and told Channel 4 News of his last-minute plea to the leaders heading for Glen Eagles. Don't drop the catch. Meaning? The ball is in the air. You've got the ball, bowled by a number of government initiatives, including the finance ministers. It's been pitched into the air by a broad cross-section of NGOs. All that, all that the heads of state have to do is to catch the ball, close the game. And that's what they must do right now. But the fear is they're going to drop, the, drop this catch at the moment. That is a big fear. That is a big fear that they'll fumble, they lose their nerve at the last moment. Certainly campaigners say we're being prepared for a disappointment with a cocktail of spin and re-announcements. The UK government and of course the, the G8 more generally are past masters at, at, at spinning the figures and it's really important to look behind the figures about at what they actually mean. Just take the $50 billion in new aid likely at the G8. $40 billion is already coming from Europe. A doubling of EU aid says Gordon Brown between 2004 when it was $42.9 billion and 2010, which is now planned to be almost $80 billion. Sounds good, but taking inflation into account shrinks that figure to $62 billion. And even before May, the EU had already planned to increase aid to $52 billion. So that's only really an increase of $10 billion. And that's just one example of how Africa might be shortchanged by the G8 if the leaders don't put their differences aside. And joining me now is Nigeria's finance minister, Dr. Ngozion Kojo Iwiala. How possible is it, do you think, that all of this could unravel on debt? Well, I, I think that um, it's gone such a long way now that uh, there must be some agreement that is reached on the debt. So I don't think it will all come unraveled. We are quite positive that will have to be done on the debt. But do you share the South African Finance Minister Trevor Manuel's concerns that they could end up there in that hotel in Glen Eagles and end up fudging it, fumbling it? The African heads of state. Uh, I think that there's so much at stake now uh, that everybody realizes there's no room for a fumble, uh, both on the side of the African heads of state as well as the side of the G8. I, I meant more on the side of the G8 really, yeah. as the ones who could end up fumbling or fudging. Well, what I, I think the only thing that could happen is that uh, there might be a spin you know, put on, on, on something that may not be quite exactly what people were expecting, making it look better than it seems. 
But I think that the G8 uh, heads of state know that they are on a spot before the whole world, well, and they you, have to deliver. When, when you look at what's effectively.